Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. President Trump imposed new sanctions against Iran Monday, targeting the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and announced forthcoming sanctions against Iran's top diplomat, Foreign Minister Javad Zarif. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani derided the announcement, saying, quote, you sanction the foreign minister simultaneously with a request for talks, while Zarif tweeted, real Donald Trump is 100 percent right that the U.S. military has no business in the Persian Gulf. Removal of its forces is fully in line with interests of U.S. and the world. But it's now clear that the B team is not concerned with U.S. interests. They despise diplomacy and thirst for war, unquote. The B team is thought to refer to John Bolton, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The sanctions came after an aborted U.S. attack on Iranian targets last week, following the downing of a U.S. Navy spy drone by Iran earlier this month, which the U.S. says happened over international waters, while Iran maintains the drone had entered its territory. Iranian officials have since released imagery, which they say confirms this. At a top-level meeting in Jerusalem between the U.S., Israel and Russia, a top Russian official contradicted the U.S. narrative, saying it had, in fact, entered Iranian territory. Iran also said Monday it had blocked cyber attacks by the United States. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has traveled to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates in an attempt to build what the Trump administration is describing as a global coalition against Iran. The Iranian ambassador to the United Nations told reporters he'd been shut out of a U.S.-led, closed-door meeting of the U.N. Security Council. This is Iran's ambassador to the United Nations, Majid Takht Ravanchi, responding to the new sanctions. The U.S. decision today to impose more sanctions against Iran is yet another indication of continued U.S. hostility against the Iranian people and their leaders, and that the U.S. has no respect for international law and order, as well as the views of an overwhelming majority of the international community. To ease tensions in the broader Persian Gulf region, the U.S. must stop its military adventurism. We'll have more on the U.S.-Iran story after headlines. The Department of Homeland Security said Monday they transferred approximately 300 children out of a Border Patrol station in Clint, Texas, following a shocking Associated Press report last week that sparked widespread outrage. Lawyers who visited the facility found children of all ages locked up without adequate food, water, sanitation or medical care, with older children caring for younger ones. Clara Long of Human Rights Watch, who interviewed children at the facility, recounted a distraught child wearing a bracelet with the words U.S. parent and a phone number, but found when calling that phone number, her parents had no idea where she was or the condition she was being held in. Some of the children were reportedly moved into a shelter overseen by the Office of Refugee Resettlement, while others are now being held in a tent facility in El Paso, Texas. Around 30 children remain at the Border Patrol station in Clint, according to the Office of El Paso Congress member Veronica Escobar. The station is not designed to hold children for more than a few days, but many of the kids have been there now for nearly a month. You can see our interview with Warren Binford, a lawyer who interviewed the children at the Clint, Texas prison, at democracynow.org. Meanwhile, the FBI is investigating the deaths of four unidentified people, including one toddler and two infants, who were found by Border Patrol agents along the Rio Grande and Texas Rio Grande Valley near the U.S.-Mexico border. The bodies were discovered Sunday, but their condition indicated they could have died days before that. Investigators say the three young children and a woman in her early 20s appear to be migrants who died from dehydration and heat exposure, though official autopsy results have yet to be released. Separately, the bodies of a Salvadoran migrant and his two-year-old daughter were found also Sunday on the Mexican side of the southern border near Brownsville, Texas, according to Mexican and Salvadoran news reports. 
President Trump responded to the firestorm surrounding E. Jean Carroll's allegation that he raped her in the 90s by telling reporters he would not have assaulted her because she's not my type, he said. An excerpt from the noted advice columnist's upcoming book accuses Trump of forcibly kissing, then raping her, in the dressing room of Bergdorf Goodman department store in New York. Over the weekend, Trump said he did not know and had never met Carol, despite a photo which accompanied the excerpt of her piece in New York Magazine showing Trump and Carol together at a party in the 1980s. At least 22 women have accused Trump of assault or sexual misconduct. In related news, The New York Times executive editor, Dean Baquet, admitted The New York Times was overly cautious in his coverage of Carol's allegations, after readers took the paper to task for downplaying the story. The New York Times initially reported the story in its online book section Friday and did not promote it on its homepage until late Saturday or run a print story until Sunday. Officials and business leaders from the U.S., Israel and several Arab nations are meeting in Bahrain today and tomorrow in what's being billed as an economic workshop designed by Trump's son-in-law, his senior advisor Jared Kushner, to address the Israel-Palestine conflict. Palestinian leadership has rejected the $50 billion U.S.-led initiative, the first phase of Kushner's so-called Middle East peace plan, which focuses on generating investment in the region while sidelining politics, the Israeli occupation and Palestinian voices. Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Shataya said ahead of the gathering, quote, this workshop is simply a political laundry for settlements and legitimization of occupation, unquote. Palestinians rallied in the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip Monday to protest the event. This is Miriam Abu Dhaka of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. If they give us all the billions in the world, we won't sell our land. Our cause is political, ethical, lawful and national. It is not for sale. It is a shameful deal. Not Trump, neither the Zionist can erase any right of the Palestinian people. An unprecedented heat wave is gripping Central Europe this week, with temperatures in France, Spain, Italy, Switzerland and Germany expected to hit 100 degrees and above, though experts say humidity will make it feel like 116 and higher. The highs will surge to 36 degrees higher than average for this time of year, setting records across French cities, where experts say heat waves are on the rise in recent years due to the accelerating climate crisis. The French national forecast service has warned record-breaking heat waves would continue to intensify and double in frequency by 2050 if global emissions are not drastically reduced. In more climate news, India's sixth-largest city has nearly run out of water. The four reservoirs that supply the five million residents of Chennai have nearly run dry, forcing many to use well water, which is not considered safe to drink, and water delivered into the city for those who can afford it. 21 Indian cities, including the capital, New Delhi, will run out of groundwater by 2020, affecting 100 million people, according to some forecasts. The water shortage is linked to the climate crisis, which has weakened the monsoon season and decreased rainfall in the region over recent years, worsening drought conditions. On Monday, the Supreme Court made it more difficult for journalists to access commercial information under the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA. The case involves a South Dakota newspaper, which was refused documents by the U.S. Agriculture Department related to grocery stores participating in the food stamp program. The publication, the Argus Leader, was investigating fraud in the federally funded program. The justices ruled 6 to 3 against the newspaper, with Justices Ginsburg, Sotomayor and Breyer dissent. The Committee to Protect Journalists said of the ruling, in order to hold institutions to account, journalists often need to petition the government to make documents public. Today's ruling will undermine the ability of reporters to access the information they need to do their jobs and is a blow to the transparency of the United States government, they said. In Oregon, state lawmakers are entering day six of a standoff after 11 state senators fled the state capitol last week to avoid voting on a landmark climate change bill. <clears throat> Some of the legislators are believed to be hiding out in Idaho.
In an unbelievable turn of events, threats of violence from right-wing militias supporting the rogue Republican legislators then led the remaining lawmakers to shut down the state capitol in Salem over the weekend. Oregon Democratic Governor Kate Brown sent out the state police to track down the state senators last week. She said Monday she won't negotiate with the lawmakers until they return to Oregon's capital. The climate bill aims to decrease emissions by implementing a statewide cap-and-trade model. Without at least two of the rogue Republican state senators present, Oregon Democrats, who control the state Senate and House of Representatives, don't have the necessary quorum to vote on the legislation. We'll go to Portland, Oregon, for more on the story uh, with Oregon Democratic State Representative and co-sponsor of the bill, Karen Power. In reproductive rights news, a judge ruled Monday Missouri's sole abortion clinic can continue providing the service through the end of this week, as Planned Parenthood continues its fight to keep its doors open. Last Friday, Missouri health officials refused to renew the clinic's license to perform abortions. Reproductive rights defenders say the health officials' decision is politically motivated and reflects Missouri's move to restrict constitutionally guaranteed abortion rights. The case will now go before an administrative panel designed to resolve disputes between state agencies and businesses. Providers at the Planned Parenthood clinic warned abortion access in Missouri could be lost by Friday if the panel fails to act or favors the health department. 9-11 first responders are meeting with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell today to urge him to back an extension to federal funding for the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund. The fund serves those who became sick as a result of their work following the 2001 terror attack. Funding is set to expire next year. Earlier this month, the former host of The Daily Show, Jon Stewart, offered an emotional testimony before a House panel in which he blasted lawmakers for their inaction. Former Pennsylvania Congress member Joe Sestak entered the crowded race to become the 2020 Democratic presidential nominee Sunday. Sestak, as a former Navy admiral, highlighted his military career in his announcement. His campaign video states his priorities as tackling climate change and restoring the U.S. global leadership. He said he wants to, quote, put an end to an illiberal world order's injustices, from China's control of the 5G network to Russian interference in democratic elections. Sestak Stack entered the race too late to qualify the, for the first Democratic debates, which are taking place later this week in Florida. The Treasury Department's internal watchdog says they'll look into why a previously agreed to redesign of the $20 bill featuring abolitionist leader Harriet Tubman will not be unveiled next year. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin came under fire after announcing last month he was delaying plans to replace Andrew Jackson's portrait on the $20 bill with Tubman. Under a 2016 Obama initiative, Tubman was originally scheduled to replace slaveholder Andrew Jackson by 2020, the hundredth anniversary of women being granted the right to vote. Harriet Tubman would be the first woman in over a century and the first African American to appear on the front of a U.S. banknote. And the U.S. women's soccer team and the U.S. Soccer Federation have agreed to mediation over a gender-based pay discrimination lawsuit filed by the 28 players in March. The suit also alleges the organization denies the women's team equal playing, training and travel conditions, and does not promote their matches as much as the men's soccer team. Figures from the U.S. Soccer Federation's own financial records show that, in the three years following the team's victory at the 2015 World Cup, ticket sales for women's games generated more total revenue than men's games, a key argument in the lawsuit. The co-captain of the women's team, Megan Rapinoe, is also making headlines during the World Cup for refusing to sing the U.S. national anthem and put her hand on her heart ahead of the games. In the past, she's also taken the knee to protest police violence and racism. Rapinoe is also an outspoken advocate for LGBTQ rights. Being a gay American, she said, I know what it means to look at the flag and not have it protect all of your liberties.
The U.S. team is heading to the World Cup quarterfinals this week, where they'll face off against France. The men's team didn't qualify. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman.